Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in the first place, I would like to thank the organizers for putting together such a nice workshop and for the opportunity to give a presentation. Today, I will talk about the dynamical structure factor of the triangular Heisenberg model, a quite old problem. And this is work that you know, we did in collaboration with Shang Shun Shang, he's a postdoc at the University of Tennessee, Yoshitomo Kamiya, who is at Riken right now, but he's moving soon to Jiaotong University in Shanghai as an assistant professor. And my friends and collaborators from the Instituto de Física de Rosario, Esteban Joldi, Adolfo Trumper, Matias González, and, and Luis Manuel. There is also a long list of experimentalists that you know, collaborated at different stages of these projects and actually provided the inspiration you know, for what I'm going to describe in the second part of the talk. And, and, and the story uh, really starts with this uh, cobalt-based compound. Cobalt in this material is in a D7 configuration. It's cobalt 3 plus. So we have seven electrons in the D shell. That means five in the T2G orbitals, two in the HEs. So we, we have a spin three halves and an effective L equal to one. So out of the spin orbit coupling, we end up with a low energy doublet, J equal one half, separated by 250K from uh, the uh, J equal three halves doublet, and then you know, at an even higher energy, you have the J equal five halves. So, but the important thing is that this gap is two orders of magnitude bigger than the scale of the interaction between these doublets, meaning that you know, one can really get rid in, you know, of these higher energy multiplets and end up with an effective uh, spin a half uh, Heisenberg model. And because uh, these octahedra, I mean, the octahedra that surround each cobalt are, you know, have octahedral symmetry to a very good approximation, you end up with a very, uh, you know, to a very good approximation with an isotropic Heisenberg interaction. Actually, DM interactions are, uh, are not allowed by symmetry in this material. Uh, there is a weak easy plane and isotropy, as we will see, simply because there is still some uh, distortion. And um, we, as I will explain in a moment, this is indeed a good uh, realization of a quasi two dimensional you know, Heisenberg model. So, uh, this is the effective Hamiltonian for the lowest energy doublet. You have, uh, as I said, an effective easy plane and isotropy, it's roughly 10%. Um, and then there is an interlayer in exchange that is of the order of 5% times the intralayer interaction. So it's, it's a nice uh, realization of the Heisenberg model in a triangular lattice. And actually, when you go and do different kind of experiments measuring essentially static properties like the magnetization versus field and um, other properties that they don't have to, time to summarize in this talk, uh, you get essentially the, the phase diagram that was originally obtained by Andre. And, and, and Golosov in, in this seminar work in 1991, where they used basically a semi-classical approach, uh, one over S expansion, and they show that as you increase the magnetic field, so at zero magnetic field, you have this well-known 120 degree magnetic ordering, and then as you increase the magnetic field, uh, there is some accidental degeneracy at the, at the classical level that is removed by order by disorder by quantum fluctuations. So this uh, 120 degree ordering basically evolves into this kind of Y-shaped type of configuration for the three sub lattices. Eventually you reach a critical magnetic field where quantum fluctuations stabilize this plateau phase where two sub lattices are up and one sub lattice is down. So this, 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 this plateau phase that was predicted in this paper is uh, of intrinsic quantum origin. And then, uh, uh, you continue with this kind of V-shaped phase uh, that appears in this phase diagram, and this kind of W phase, if you want, appears in, the re in this material simply because of the interlayer interaction. So that is a consequence of the actually 3D structure of this, of this model. But you know, as you can see, uh, the, the quantum phase diagram is, is really well described by this semi-classical approach, and actually one can also describe the NMR line shape you know, for the different phases that are appearing as a function of field, so no mystery up, up to this point. So the surprise appeared when uh, my colleagues you know, from Oak Ridge uh, went and measured the inelastic neutron scattering spectrum of this. Uh, sorry, sorry. Do you think there is a phase transition at zero magnetic field? At zero magnetic field uh, as a function of temperature? Previous sorry? Previous slide. Previous slide, sorry. Yes. You mean as a function of temperature or as a function? 
As a function of temperature, yes. So what is the question? If there is a phase transition, one of, I mean, yeah, I mean like for the, for the three-dimensional material, you're talking about the two-dimensional or the three-dimensional? Yeah, 3D, right? So, yeah. So anyway, uh, so let me continue. So this is the inelastic uh, scattering spectrum and the anomaly that you know, my colleagues noticed in this spectrum was an anomalous broadening of the magnon peak of the magnon line around this point of the brilliant zone. This is the end point. So this is a cat as a function of energy at the end point. And uh, the only thing they notice is that the, the, the width of these peaks was uh, significantly larger than the experimental resolution. So this was actually the motivation for trying to understand, you know, first the origin of this uh, broadening, if it was real. Um, and, and the first thing you do is you say, well, you know, probably this, in a semi-classical description, this broadening is produced by single magnon to two magnon decay. So you go and include the next order correction in one over S. Uh, you go beyond linear spin waves, and uh, you try to see if you can explain this broadening in that way, and also the, the, spin, the, the bandwidth renormalization uh, that, that, that is observed, because you know, if you essentially compute with linear spin wave theory, you get these white lines that you know, have a bandwidth that is much bigger uh, than, than the experimental bandwidth. Now, um, as I will explain in a moment, actually that doesn't work. Uh, for, for reasons that will become clear immediately. So first of all, with this kind of model, you don't get spontaneous single magnet to two magnet decay because the kinematic conditions are violated, and that's essentially because of the easy plane anisotropy that you have in the material, that although it's small, it's relevant. And, um, <clears throat> but you know, what actually was more so, so basically what happens is you do the nonlinear spin wave calculation, you get, I mean, you know the exchange parameters here by different means, you know, from thermodynamic measurements and also from the long wavelength limit of this spin wave calculation. In the long wavelength limit, even the linear spin wave is a good approach. And you end up with, uh, with a bandwidth, with a nonlinear spin wave theory that is 2.4 milli electron volts, while the experimental bandwidth is 1.6. So here you have another anomaly. But perhaps the most interesting anomaly is what happens in the high energy part of the spectrum. And this was revealed by a beautiful experiment that came afterwards in 2017 by the group of uh, Professor Tanaka in Japan, where uh, he showed that besides you know, the magnum dispersion that you have at low energies, you get all this spectral weight at higher energies that is also dispersive, right? So here you can see again a cat at the end point. So this is this point in the brilliant zone. So here, these are the two magnum peaks at low energy. And here you have this broad continuum that, according to uh, uh, this group, extends up to six times the single magnum bandwidth. And moreover, when you go and integrate the weight under this continuum, it's, it's, it's roughly it's, it's more than twice the weight that you have under the two magnum peaks. If you go and do the nonlinear spin wave calculation at the same point, what you get is two very sharp magnum peaks and a very small uh, intensity in the continuum. So actually, intensity in the continuum uh, turns out to be significantly smaller than the intensity that you have, 1.5 times smaller that you have under the magnum peaks. So the question is why? First of all, why this semi-classical approach, uh, can, you know, it's not, it's not producing a large renormalization of the bandwidth that you will expect for the isotropic model. And second, uh, why is that, you know, you don't get this kind of broadening of, of the magnum peaks that you will also expect for the isotropic model. So first of all, why in the isotropic limit you do expect some strong renormalization? So the reason is that in the isotropic limit you have two types of Goldstone modes. You have one Goldstone mode around uh, the k equal to zero, the gamma point, and, and, two, and two Goldstone modes around plus k and minus k. And these Goldstone modes have different velocities, meaning that if you start with a magnum uh, that has higher velocity around the gamma point, that can decay into two magnons at k and minus k, right? And because of that, uh, uh, this single magnon mode enters in the two magnon continuum. You have single magnon to two magnon decay because of cubic processes that are allowed in this case because the ordering is non-collinear. And uh, besides, you know, this broadening of the single magnon line, you get a strong renormalization of uh, 
the magnum bandwidth that was noticed already in this paper and uh, explained very beautifully in this other paper by uh, Shitomirsky and, and, and Sasha Chernyshev. The problem is that as soon as you put a small anisotropy, 10%, right, you go about this mode, right? You go from having three Goldstone modes to having one. And now, uh, kinematic conditions do not allow any more to, to, you know, for this, this magnum cannot decay into two magnums here because, you know, this, this, two man, you know, this will correspond to a very high energy final state. So you cannot conserve energy and momentum anymore. So now, you know, the two magnum continuum, you get separated from the single magnum dispersion and you don't have the strong renormalization that you will expect for the isotropic limit. Uh, it is because of that, essentially, that you, know, you go from this picture, that is what you will obtain in the isotropic limit. You have one you know, stable magnum mode, and this one that you can see is overdamped, to this picture, where now you have you know, two very sharp magnum modes, and now small intensity in the continuum. Here you have large intensity. This, is, again, is the isotropic case. This is the real case, I mean, for the, that applies to this material, where actually you have two things that are playing against this single magnet, this single, single magnet to two magnet decay, the anisotropy, and actually the interlayer interaction also is important. Anyway, so uh, then the question is, okay, is this anom are these anomalies that are observed at zero magnetic field of intrinsic origin, or it is disorder, or phonons, or something extrinsic that is producing this? Behavior. So one way of answering that question is you apply magnetic field, right? By applying magnetic field, you make the system more classical. You, classical, you start suppressing quantum fluctuations, and then you expect uh, that if uh, disorder is not present and if uh, spin uh, phonon interaction is weak, then at some point this uh, semi-classical approach should, should start working. Now, in this material, ideally, you would like to go to the saturation field, but in this material, the saturation field is 30 tesla. So you cannot do neutron scattering in 30 tesla. But what you can do is you can reach with 10 tesla this up-up-down phase, the first plateau, right? That is collinear, is gapped. So you expect that although it is stabilized by quantum fluctuations, a semi-classical approach actually will work reasonably well to describe the excitations. And actually, that was... I mean, it is tricky how to implement a semi-classical approach here because this phase is stabilized by quantum fluctuations, so you need to use some sort of trick that was introduced in this paper by Jason, Alicia, and company. Uh, what you do is you choose the magnetic field uh, for which the classical phase diagram will give you this up, up, down ordering. It's one precise value of the magnetic field. You do uh, the nonlinear spin wave uh, approximation on top of that point, and then you introduce as a perturbation the deviation of the field from that point, right? You will get gapped dispersion, so it will be robust until, you know, at some point, you know, for some critical value of the field, you, the gap will close and you will have a transition into this phase or this phase, depending on whether you're increasing or decreasing the field relative to that point. Uh, one important thing is that uh, because the interlayer interaction is antiferromagnetic, the minority spin right, alternates, you know, from one sublattice to another sublattice when you go from one layer to another, meaning that you have a doubling of the unit cell along the z-direction. So when you go and compare, right, the results of this nonlinear spin wave approximation with experiment, now you get a beautiful agreement, right? The, the reason why you see, you know, two magnum lines that are separated by a small energy is because of this doubling of the unit cell along uh, the z-direction. And the, the splitting is small because the interlayer coupling is only 5% of the intralayer coupling. Good. So, um, moreover, if you now change the magnetic field and, and look at the low energy branches, what you do, I mean, what you get is a confirmation of, of what was predicted in this paper by Jason Alisi and company, which is that the lowest energy branches, I mean, different low energy branches get gapless. So if you increase the field, you know, this low energy branch becomes gapless, and that signals the transition into this kind of V-shaped phase. If you lower the field, uh, this other branch becomes gapless, and that signals the transition into this kind of Y-like y phase. Right? And you can see that agreement is remarkably good over the whole field range that covers this, this plateau. So bottom line, semi-classical theory works really well. You get essentially the same model. The parameters are fixed, right? 
So we have a situation where uh, semi-classical theory works really well in the plateau phase 10.5 Tesla, but it fails uh, in different aspects at zero magnetic field. So that at least uh, indicates that these deviations that are observed at zero field have an intrinsic quantum origin, and that sets a challenge, right, for, you know, how do we describe then uh, the, 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 the spectrum of this uh, triangular lattice system at, at zero magnetic field. And this is the moment where you start remembering that, you know, actually many years ago, Phil Anderson proposed this model as, you know, a potential model for realizing the RBB spin liquid. Uh, later on, uh, simulations, numerical work showed that actually the system does order magnetically, although, as I will discuss in a moment, the reduction of the order of the moment is more than 50%, right? So, uh, so basically, uh, what may be happening in this system is that although it orders magnetically, it is not too far from, let's say, the quantum melting point that will indicate a transition into a spin liquid phase. And actually, there are DMRC calculations by Steve White and Sasha Chernyshev recently that show that if you put a second neighbor interaction that is 5% of the first neighbor interaction, that's enough to melt this 120 degree ordering into a, a spin liquid. That is the MRG results. So indeed, it is true that we are close to one of these points. And then the question is, okay, if we were far away, deep inside the semi-classical regime, you know, it's natural to use a gas of non-interacting magnons as your starting point. Essentially, that is large S expansion. And then try to understand the excitations, you know, in terms of semi-classical theory. But if, if it turns out that you are close to this point, then, you know, probably it is not a good idea to start with a gas of non-interacting magnons. Maybe it is better to start with a gas of non-interacting spinons and then recover the magnons through a Higgs uh, condensation, basically, of this spinon field. And uh, essentially, the magnons will become collective modes in this uh, gas of spinons that interact via gauge fluctuations. So those are nice words. The question is, how do you implement that? And you know, the natural way of implementing that is through a large N expansion, right? So you can now uh, choose to represent your spins in terms of bilinear forms of these so-called Schwinger boson operators. And in order to fix the representation of your spin field, you need to impose a constraint that is the total number of bosons here Bosons have two flavors, up and down, because we are working with SU2. And uh, basically, the number of these bosons in each side you know, determines the representation. So if we work, if we focus on spin one half, we have one boson per side. And uh, normally, when you implement, I mean, the original formulation of Arovas and Auerbach, if you do simply saddle point or, or mean field, one of the nice things about this approach is that uh, the, the, the fields that you condense are, are invariant under the symmetry group of the Hamiltonian. In other words, they are singlets. Both of them are singlets under rotations, and loud, unlike the usual mean field theory where you condense things that uh, break the symmetry. And so basically, the, 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 the ordering here in this approach occurs via spontaneous symmetry breaking, via spontaneous condensation of these bosons. You are not breaking the symmetry by taking the mean value. So, um, and it turns out that, you know, if you had a bipartite lattice with antiferromagnetic ordering, this will be the right operator to condense. If you had ferromagnetic ordering on a bipartite system, this will be the operator that you condense. But, you know, in, if you have a 120 degree ordering, you have both ferro and antiferro components. So it's better to keep both. And there are some deeper reasons for keeping both that actually are described in this paper of Rebecca and Pierce, because, you know, if you, Want to do a large expansion in a non bipartite system, you need to work with the SPN group, and this becomes the natural decomposition. So, if you want to go beyond the saddle point approximation, because I mentioned that I want to include the interaction between spinons, it is better to go directly to a path integral formulation of the problem. So, you write your Lagrangian now, there is the topological term in terms of the Schinger bosons plus the Hamiltonian. You add the sources that you need to compute uh, correlation functions. And something that is critical in this calculation is you add a small symmetry breaking field 
because these bosons, when they condense, they can condense in a singlet state, or they can condense in the state that you know, actually breaks the symmetry and gives you the 120 degree ordering. And to get that condensate, the one that you know, corresponds to the 120 degree ordering, you need to do what is described in the books. Essentially, you put a small symmetry breaking field, you first take the thermodynamic limit, and then you send that magnetic field to zero. Right? So in that way, you make sure that you are condensing the bosons in the states that you know, gives you the 120 degree ordering, and then you will get you know, different uh, you know, transverse and longitudinal modes, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, the rest of the story is basically straightforward. Uh, you, you now introduce the Havard Stratonovich uh, decomposition using these fields A and B that I introduced before. You integrate out the bosons, and you end up with an action that is a function of your Havard Stratonovich fields. Uh, the phases of these Havard Stratonovich fields and the chemical potential, sorry, here, you know, this basically chemical potential is introduced here to enforce the constraint of one particle per site. Those are basically the gauge fields of your theory that are coupled to this pinon field. And in order to develop some diagrammatic expansion of this problem, uh, your basic elements are the spinon propagator at the saddle point level, the RPA propagator that is essentially the inverse of the fluctuation matrix that you get if you do a Gaussian expansion around the saddle point in these havard stratonovich fields. And then you have external vertices associated with these uh, sources, J, that you need for computing you know, correlation functions. And you have internal vertices that you know, give you the interaction between this matter field, this pinon field, with, with the gauge field. So uh, at the saddle point level, we know that we are going to get a result that is qualitatively wrong, right? Because at the saddle point level, our spinons are not interacting, they are free. So basically, if we compute the, the dynamical susceptibility, uh, what we will get is you know, we insert a spin excitation. That spin excitation will decay into two spinons, right? The spinons will reconnect and come out, meaning that what you will get is simply a two spinon continuum, right? A branch cut singularity, no poles, no magnons. And this is the reason why no one really likes to use this approach, at least at the saddle point level to describe you know, the magnetic excitations of a magnetically ordered system. You need to go beyond saddle point. So now, if you go beyond the saddle point level, uh, you get these four diagrams to order one over n. The way you compute the order of a diagram is uh, you, each wavy line, each RPA propagator introduces a one over n, and each internal loop, like this one, introduces a factor of n. So you can count and see that you know, here you have only one wavy line, one over n, one wavy line, one over n, one wavy line, one over n. Here, one wavy line, one internal loop. Basically, it's two wavy lines, sorry, and one internal loop. Again, one over n. Now, in the rest of the talk, I will focus on this diagram. And the reason is that this is the only diagram that can introduce poles in, in, the, in, in, in the S of k anomaly. We are looking for magnons, for poles. And you can immediately see here that this RPA propagator is evaluated the same k and omega as the external line. So poles of the RPA propagator will immediately become the new poles that you get in S of q and omega. Now, that diagram, right, you know, it's interesting to, to see what happens if you compute that diagram on top of a condensate that doesn't break the symmetry, right? So if you condense your spinons in a singlet state, uh, this diagram contains this loop. This loop is a cross susceptibility between an external line and an internal field. As I explained before, the external lines, of course, are basically spin components, right? They transform like vectors. The internal lines are these Havard Stratonovich fields that I said they are scalars. So if your ground state at the saddle point level is a singlet state, the expectation value of this bubble will be zero, right? So this diagram will, will cancel. Now, this is the reason why it is important to put this symmetry breaking field because you know once you have a spin on condensate in this broken symmetry state, this diagram, this bubble actually becomes non zero. This diagram then becomes finite. And when you go and compute, so you add this correction to the saddle point level, so you get this comparison. So this is what you get at the saddle point level. 
This is the component of the dynamical spin structure factor in the direction perpendicular to the plane of the 120 degree ordering, while uh, this is the component in the plane, right? You have the two directions are equivalent in that plane, so you get here I, I'm, I'm plotting the average of those two components. And this is the sum of, of these two, the sum of the three is the trace, if you want, of S of Q and omega. Now, uh, there are several disturbing things at the saddle point level. So I mentioned already one, the fact that, you know, these lines actually are not poles, are branch cut singularities that, you know, correspond to the lower edge of the sp two spin on continuum. But moreover, you get these spurious modes, right, and physical modes, that uh, you can tell that they are unphysical because if instead of computing the S of Q and omega, you compute the density-density correlations, you get a maximum at these modes, and you know that density should not fluctuate in this approach, right? You know, the constraint is that you should have one boson per site, so you know that these modes are unphysical. So these are the two reasons why, you know, people try to stay away, right, you know, from this kind of saddle points if you are describing a magnetically ordered system. The nice surprise is that as soon as you add these Gaussian fluctuations, this other diagram, first of all, these uh, spurious modes cancel exactly. The second thing is that this maximum that you get at the lower edge of the two spin on continuum, right, this part disappears. And moreover, you start getting your magnon dispersion, right, your collective modes at low energies. Right here, you can see it more clearly, the magnum dispersion, right? So now you recover your magnum modes and you re eliminate all these spurious effects that you get at the saddle point level. And to show you in that in more detail, you know, here I'm showing the saddle point result. This is, you know, spurious mode plus the bottom of the two spin on continuum. You can see that the one over n correction cancels exactly these contributions. And now uh, the new thing is a new peak that, you know, is a pole, now it's, it's a magnum in S of Q and omega, right? So you get a qualitative improvement when you include this, this correction. Now, although this story is all motivated by the high energy modes, by the fact that, you know, Tanaka observed this continuum of high energy modes up to roughly six times the magnum bandwidth, uh, sanity check of this story is to go to the long wavelength limit now and try to see if, you know, this reproduces what, uh, you get from spin waves that you know that it should work in the long wavelength limit. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Right. So it's is is one over n correction is is this blue line, right? It's the diagram that I showed before, right? The wavy line. You, you don't need to put, any, to, to put any particular value of n at this point. You are summing, you know, contributions coming from, you know, diagrams that appear to different order in one over n. I don't need to specify n at this point, right? What is, what is n Well, if n is equal to infinity, then, you know, you will get, you know, basically you will end up with this. But if n is equal to infinity, then, you know, this other point also doesn't make any sense. Yes. So uh, basically here it appears uh, the cancellation seems to happen, you know, for any value of n, right? So it's not something that, you know, you need to put n uh, in advance somehow. I mean, we can discuss it later. But. So, you know, the other uh, interesting thing is that, you know, if you now compute the, uh, in the long wavelength limit, you compute the single, single magnum dispersion. Uh, you get, uh, of course, a linear dispersion. You, know, you get the, your Goldstone modes, and you get some velocity. Is, uh, you know, around the gamma point is given by this value with a small decay that is, is proportional to Q squared. So now you can go and compare right, this uh, spin wave velocity versus, uh, you know, the spin wave calculation actually with a nonlinear correction. And, you know, what you get is that, you know, the, both around the, K, the gamma point and the plus minus K point, these uh, spin wave velocities actually turn out to be very similar. So somehow 
you reproduce uh, pretty well the, you know, the hydrodynamic limit that, as I said, you know, you know is, is well described by the one over S expansion. So uh, the other check that you know, one can run is simply compute the ordered moment. You can compute the ordered moment by taking the derivative of the ground state energy as a function of this symmetry breaking field. And uh, you, know, you can do this calculation in different ways. You, know, you have to be careful because you know, here you have zero modes associated with this gauge invariance. So you can either use Fadepopov or you can truncate your fluctuation matrix. In both cases, you get the same result. And what you get is that the ordered moment is 0 0.22. The full moment is 0 0.5. So basically, uh, this number is quite close, actually, to values that were obtained you know, with different numerical approaches. This is density matrix normalization group. This is quantum Monte Carlo. And this is uh, series expansions. Uh, if at the saddle point level, you get 0 0.28. And with nonlinear spin waves, you get 0 0.25. Uh, the other check is, you know, you can go and uh, compare uh, the magnum dispersion that you obtain with these, uh, basically, saddle point plus fluctuations against the result of series expansions. This was done in 2006 by Rajiv Singh and company. And what you find out now is that the bandwidth is roughly 20% bigger, the bandwidth of the series expansions, is 20% bigger than what you get uh, with this, uh, you know, one over n approach. The, okay, so keeping this in mind, uh, now, you know, it's time to go back to the actual compound. So far I have described, you know, what happens for the, for the 2D limit, for the 2D Heisenberg model. And, you know, in that case, you have to introduce two additional basic Howard Stratanovich uh, fields. And when you do the calculation back to, to this compound, you basically get um, now a dispersion, a single magnum dispersion that has a bandwidth of 1.3 milli electron volts, while the experimental bandwidth is actually 1.6. So you underestimate roughly also by 20% the experimental bandwidth. Finally, I mean, uh, in addition to the two magnum modes, I mean, here one of the magnums is overdamped. You get this high energy continuum uh, here uh, that cor corresponds to the spin to spin on continuum and you know, may be connected to this high energy continuum that is observed in Tanaka's experiment. Uh, actually, the, 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 the experimental continuum extends up to you know, higher energies, even higher energies, higher energies than the two spin on continuum. And finally, um, so to conclude, you know, let me say that you know, one can reproduce pretty well, uh, at least this qualitative aspect of the um, high energy part of the continuum of, you know, of this material using this one over n approach, but you know, keeping going beyond the saddle point level, the magnum dispersion is roughly 20% lower in bandwidth than what you will get uh, you know, with, uh, you know, in the experiment. Uh, you get a qualitative improvement relative to, to saddle point, right? because you get this removal of, of, of the spurious modes. And then, um, in addition, you get this extended to spin on continuum. You get correct order of moments and magnum velocities in the, in the long wavelength limit. And something that you know, I didn't have time to discuss, which is that you, know, you can reproduce uh, the, um, you know, basically, if you take the large S limit in this approximation, so in the constraint you put S very large, you get exactly the result of spin waves. So basically, you reproduce spin waves in the large S limit. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.